Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day. What a glorious time and a glorious opportunity to be with you. Lord, we pray at this time to speak to every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. That these words that proceed out of the mouth of Christ will do every one of us, the followers of Christ, real good in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Not just for a short time, but for the rest of our lives, these words will keep on working mightily, effectually in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Yeah. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. Matthew chapter 5, we're looking at verse 12. Matthew chapter 5, verse 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted thee the prophets which were before you. We come back again to the message of Christ. And Christ here now tells us what we are to do. How we approach life. When things happen that you do not understand. And many, many things will happen in life that you will never understand. Many things happen to patriarchs of old, the people of old, the prophets of old, that they didn't understand. You think about Joseph, how could they have understood? The persecution, the envy, the jealousy, the suffering that he endured. You think about people like Daniel, how could they understand? Just by taking their stand and by serving the Lord to go through everything he went through. Think of Jeremiah. As you think of Jeremiah, how could he have understood? Here were the supposed people of God. I am a prophet of God. And the prophet and the people should have been joined together. And I brought a message from their God. And see what they are trying to do. He couldn't understand. She dropped me shack and a bed nigger. How could they understand? We well, have been serving the kingdom of this man, Nebuchadnezzar, with all our heart. And we have not in any way been unfaithful. And yet, just because of bowing down, which would not have taken five minutes if we wanted to, just because we refuse to bow. And we tell him, we have our own God that we serve. See what he's planning and see what he's doing. How could they understand how many times when things happen in your life that you don't understand? It brings sorrow, it brings sadness, and it brings grief and the loss of all joy. And Jesus Christ knowing the composition of man, the constitution of man, that is the, the link or the connection between the mind and the body, between the spirit and the body. And between your emotion and your health. That's why Jesus Christ said, you don't understand. That grief, sadness, sorrow, worry, anxiety, fear, anger, hatred, malice, negative emotion will break down your system. You'll die before your time. And I have a lot of work for you. Therefore, you build up yourself. And it is the joy, the gladness, the happiness that beats you up. And actually, when you're a joyful person, a happy person, a glad person, it builds up your health. And Jesus Christ knowing that you will tear down your system. If you are plagued with worry and anxiety and all those negative emotions, he said, persecution will come. And I'm preparing your mind for it. And then it says, when it comes, rejoice. And be exceeding glad. Not just that you are glad moderately. You are glad exceedingly. You are glad at the height of joy. Why? Because what the enemy wants you to do is to sink low. And to be so unhappy. And to be so dejected. And to be so discouraged and to be so depressed and that will make you sick and Jesus wants you to be well and he wants you to keep healthy 
not just getting sick, getting well, getting sick, getting well, getting sick, getting well. He says, no. And he says, the way to just be on top of the world and to walk on the stormy waters of life and to be healthy and to be sound and to be ready for the ministry the Lord has given you is always to carry a joyful atmosphere along with you a happy look along with you and a happy joyful glad attitude that nothing ever brings you down that's why it says rejoice in fact the way you see it in Luke look at Luke chapter 6 in Luke chapter 6 reading from verse 22 and verse 23 it says blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company I shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake rejoice ye in that day you see the emphatic way and the firm authoritative way like an imperative don't sit down and mourn don't back out and get discouraged rejoice ye and leap for joy, jump for joy, become young again. How many of you know that when you leap, when you trot, when you wake up in the morning and you go for a walk, and when there's nothing in your heart depressing, nothing in your soul discouraging, and then in your body, your bones are being renewed every time you're walking, you're jumping, and you're not even thinking of the problems you have. It renews your use as that of the ego. That's why it says there is power in joy. Rejoice in that day and live for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Now you know that good food or good balanced diet strengthens the body. And it's what we call mental diet. That is your emotion, your thoughts, the things you imagine, your dreams, your desires, and your attitude being on the positive side of life. You know anything that happens, there's a positive side. You know, if it's raining, somebody can say, what a bad day. Another person will say, what a fresh, cool day. If it's very, if it's shiny and the sun is very hot, somebody can say, what a lousy day. The other person can say, what a bright day. If somebody gets late to you, and some, you may all be ruffled and unhappy and dejected. Why is it like this? Uh, you may have the attitude, what a bad fellow. Or you may have an attitude, what a confident man. That even though he's late, yet he's not killing himself because of that. You see, there are two sides to life. Anything that happens, you can have a negative attitude and destroy yourself. You can have a depressing attitude and destroy yourself. And you can have a discouraging kind of atmosphere around you that the thoughts within and the air around you, the atmosphere around you is all depressing and discouraging and your face is gloomy. Everything is down and you make yourself see. Or you can have a bright attitude, a joyful attitude and not care at all what is happening around you and say that nobody can take the joyful attitude and the happy life and the happy emotion away from you. That's why Jesus Christ said, rejoice. And when you rejoice like that, he says, be exceeding glad. Exceeding glad because great is your reward in heaven. Our mental diet helps our emotion and strengthens our mind. And I can tell you, a strong mind will build a strong body. A peaceful mind will build a calm body. There will be no arthritis. All your joints that are stiff. And then you're always thinking about yourself. And you're self-consumed. All that will not be there. You let go. And when you let go like that, no strings attached to you. You are not binding yourself. You are not binding your joints. You are not binding your mind. And you are not gloomy and moody sitting down somewhere thinking that, you know, all the world should revolve around me. And because I am stopping, the whole world should stop its motion. 
But when you are happy and you have that mental diet of a joyful mind, you will maintain a strong, healthy body. Joy assists our faith, assists our hope, assists our love. You know, it's, it's very difficult for somebody who is moody, unhappy, thinking about himself. I'm unfortunate. I don't know why life is like this. When I want sunshine, there is rain. The day I want rain, there is sunshine. When I want people to visit me, I don't see anybody. When I want to be left alone, it's when they all come. If you're like that, you'll even be spreading sorrow and sadness all around. But if you're joyful, if you're happy, and whatever is happening, you say, this is not even up to what happened to Joseph. And Joseph kept himself and was still a happy man. I'm going to be happy. And then anything happens again, you say, hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how did you feel when they were tying you up? And Shadrach, if you know them, if you have read the Bible, they say, we're worried about nothing because already we have decided the result before the beginning of the game. And we had already told the man how the game is going to end. Our God is able. And that face brings to joy. And therefore, whatever is happening, the joy of the Lord will be there. And so there you understand that sorrow of heart will just depress you. And will cause despair. And even sickness in Nehemiah chapter 2. In Nehemiah chapter 2. We're looking at verse 2 and see the comment of this king on Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 2. Wherefore the king said unto me, why is thy countenance sad? Why is thy countenance sad? Can I answer the question for you? If your heart is sorrowful, your countenance will be sad. If your countenance is sad, it weakens you. Look up here. You know sometimes you are, it's like, let's say you have good news. You've just taken exam. And that exam you are taking, they just told you now that have you seen the result? You say, watch. And they say, you came up as number one of the whole list. It's on the, it's on the board. Have you seen it? And then you're very happy. At that time, if you had headache, before that news, the headache just goes of itself. I'm telling you. If you, had, if you were very, very hungry and you said, I'm very hungry, my stomach is biting me. When you hear that good news, the hunger, you don't know where the hunger has gone. Am I talking to you? Yes. And then, but now as you are very happy and you want to go to the board and look at the result, somebody came to you and said, did you see anybody from home yesterday? No, not at all. Uh -huh. So you don't know what has happened. What's that? Well, I, I really don't want to tell you. I don't want to spoil your day. But somebody has to tell you. Because it has happened, it has happened. You say, what? Now, even though he has not even told you, your joy has gone down. And the speech in your feet, want you to run and go and look at the board, it's like your strength is gone. Already you are going down. You are getting prepared for the bad news. Even the preparation for the bad news that you have not had weakens you already. And then it says, I'm sorry. To tell you this, it's mama we are talking about. Mama is dead. Your feet cannot carry you at that time. You say, please, let me find a place to sit down. Then you sit down. Say, tell me more. And it begins to tell you, this is what happened. This is what happened. You lose appetite. Am I right? Yes. Then even to talk, you forget vocabulary. It affects your brain. It affects your mind. It affects your strength. If you work to carry a bucket of water that you just carry like this with one hand, that time you use your two hands like this, you cannot have the strength to carry that bucket. Because the bad news comes to depress you. And it's the inner man that gives your body strength. And it's the inner man that gives your body weakness. And sickness as well. That's why the king said, Nehemiah, why is thy countenance sad? See, thou art not sick. This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. You look sick. 
But this is not ordinary sickness. This is the effect of your mind on your body. Think about that. This is an internal problem that is oozing out of you. And the internal condition then depreciates, destroys, and makes you to have disease in your external body. It says, this is nothing but sore of heart. Then I was so afraid. Uh -huh. And that didn't solve the problem because you see, if you already have depression, you already have sickness, you already have weakness, and then you join fear with it, that's a great load to bear. But perpetual joy in our spirit, perpetual joy in our soul will keep us alive of our persecutors and will keep us on top of all our problems in the path of progress and in the enjoyment of good health and strength and power. That's why the Lord is saying, rejoice. And again I say unto you, rejoice. Be exceedingly glad. If you are like that, you are going to stay healthy for the rest of your life in Jesus' name. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, the strengthening power of joy. The strengthening power of joy. Number two, the spiritual peel in joy. The peel you swallow. That one is physical. That one is scientific. That's all right. But there is something that is beyond science. It's not just a scientific peel, medical peel. This is talking about a spiritual peel. The spiritual peel in joy. Number three. The steady progress of the joyful. The steady progress of the joyful. Let's come to number one. The strengthening power of joy. In Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 12 again. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Rejoice. Why? Because joy has a way of strengthening you. When you are joyful internally, when you are happy internally, when you have this mental diet we're talking about, and your mind is joyful, your mind is happy, your mind, you're glad in your soul. It gives you strength. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat a fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them, for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto the Lord. Neither be ye sorry, neither be ye sorrowful, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Look at that verse 10. Go your the fat. Don't eat too much of it. You know, Nima was telling them, just this day. Just this day. Take care of your diet. See, when you, when there's too much fat, I don't mean that you are fat. That's not what I'm talking about. In your diet, in your food. If it's fat, 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 every time, you're going to injure yourself. In fact, when you take what they call the red meat, the cow, and all these things rated with that every time. Too much of that. You're going to injure yourself physically. In the fact, you know, once in a while, and there are people that if you take a, let's say, ice cream once a year, that doesn't, that doesn't ruin your health. But if you take ice cream every day, <clears throat> that's a problem. If you take chocolate, just like once a year, twice a year, and that doesn't really spoil your health. But if you take chocolate every day, I, I, you just love it. You just love it. Eat the fat, and everything is fat, fat, fat. That's going to ruin your health. A little, maybe once a year, twice a year, that's okay. And then it says, drink the sweet. Taking something very sweet. You know, there are people that will have a lot of sugar. In their either bomb beta or pronto or whatever, or even tea or whatever it is. A lot of sugar. 
you know, once in a while, eat the sweet. Take the sweet. Once in a while, it's okay. That will not spoil your health. But every time, every time, when you add the fat and the sweet, every day, they just collapse. You, you, you destroy yourself. And then it says, send portions unto them. For whom nothing is prepared. Be generous and have the joy of helping other people. The joy of ministering something to other people. And then he says, this is a holy day. Holy unto the Lord. Neither be ye sorrowful. Don't be depressed. Don't be worried. Don't be anxious. And you know sometimes we don't think through about some of these things in life. Well, something has happened. That scene is bad. That scene is not good. I mean, just that information. Nehemiah had information in the first passage I read from home that this is the situation. Now, Nehemiah, can we discuss together? If you stop your job and you miss your salary because of the news you heard, Nehemiah, losing your salary, will that improve the situation at home? No. If you become discouraged and you become depressed and we have to carry you into the mental home to see the psychiatrist, Nehemiah, is that going to solve the problem at home? No. Nehemiah, if you become so greed and so sad that the king will look at your face and he will say, this man cannot work with me anymore. I don't want any gloomy face around me here in the kingdom. And then other people have made application. I'm going to replace you. If you are replaced, Nehemiah, does that solve the problem at home? No. In fact, it's going to aggravate the problem at home. Because now you don't have the skill. You don't have the power. You don't have the finance to be able to even help at home. So the solution, whenever we had we any bad news, the solution is not sorrow. The solution is, is not depression. The solution is sit down. Pray. Look at the promise of God in the Bible that matches this problem. And then take it to the Lord in prayer. And then make your plans. And then develop your strategy. And say this problem here, how can we solve it? Can I find somebody in the Bible or in contemporary times that had a similar problem like this before and got it solved? Yes. Then get going and start working. And then put all your plans out. And then what strategies will I employ? Am I going to talk to the king? Then you pray for favor before the king. That, that's the approach to take when there's a problem. But just, you know, getting dejected and getting discouraged and just crying and just weeping and not eating. Now, if you don't eat, are you going to have strength? How do you solve the problem? Are we just to be, you know, mourning over the problem and not find a way to solve our problems? That's what the Lord is telling us today. Don't get dejected. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You will be strong in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter, eh, sorry, Psalm 51. Psalm 51, I'm, asking, I'm, I'm reading from verse 8. In Psalm 51, verse 8, make me to hear joy and gladness. Make me to hear joy and gladness. This is David. And you know, David, he had quite a lot of bad news that came to him in his life. From his own personal life, something wrong. And then his own children too. His own children did not really encourage and did not improve the matter at all. But now you said, oh Lord, I'm asking for something. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. The man was sick. The man was sick. The bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Now when it says broken there, it doesn't mean that the bones actually broke. It's like when you have a broken heart. When we talk of a broken heart, sorrowful, sad, the hands are down, the eyes are dim, and you are walking like this, and you are absent-minded, and you are talking to yourself, and you are saying, but why me? But why me? And then you meet a friend. Hey, how are you? Oh, are you there? I didn't even see you. What do you mean? I've been staying here in front of me for such a long time. I didn't see me at all. I, I, you know, I was far gone. My thoughts, uh, you know, I wasn't here. My, my body was just here. 
what's the problem and then your leaves begin to tremble and the tears start to what's the problem my dear sister what's the problem and then you say it's like i want to faint now what's the problem it's your thought and it's because of that you're killing yourself god is still on the throne and this problem will be solved in Jesus' name. <laughs> you know, there are people that they give up too soon. And because they give up too soon, and it's sorrow and sadness. I read about a man. And this man, the people that were making investigation, he's a businessman. Uh, they were making his investigation, and they thought and they said that there is mineral, gold in the you know, under the earth in the soil of his farm and then he, he got all his money together and he spent one hundred thousand dollars and he dug and dug and dug and all these machineries were there and he didn't find any gold after they had dug very very deep into the earth the fellow became discouraged he sat down somewhere look up here when I said he sat down somewhere, I almost wanted to say he sat down somewhere. Then I said, ah, that's not where we sit. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. He sat down somewhere and he was dejected. And he said, what will I do? Then he was so discouraged. Remember, he had spent $100,000, not Naira, dollars. And then he said, who wants to buy? And then somebody, intelligent man, happy man, joyful man, says, no, no big deal, I'll buy. And he, he sold the place for peanuts. He sold the machinery, he sold the land, sold everything. The title deeds, he gave to him. And then that fellow got expats together. And from the place that he stopped, those people dug a yard further and they got to gold. A yard, just a yard. And the man had done almost all the work. But discouragement and depression made him to stop. And the fellow he sold it to, that fellow done just a yard. And then everything came out and the man became the richest man in his country. And the fellow that sold it, he was just looking, became almost like a beggar. Don't do that. Don't sell off your heritage. And the Lord will see you through in Jesus' name. The persecution of today will not continue forever. The problem of today will not continue forever. A bright day is coming. And a joyful time is coming. And all these things we are thinking about today, there will be no more in Jesus' name. In Psalm 28, Psalm 28, I'm reading from verse 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart was set in thee. And I am held, therefore, my heart greatly rejoices. My heart greatly rejoices. And with my son, will I praise him, but say the Lord is their strength. And he is a saving strength of his anointed. That's what joy does for us. And then we're told in Psalm 35. Psalm 35. I'm reading from verse 9. And from verse 10, Psalm 35, verse 9, verse 10. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. In the Lord. Once we are in the Lord, no problem. Once we are in the Lord, you know the Lord is able to do all things. And you know, because you are in the Lord, all things are possible for him who believes. It shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, the Lord shall. Who is like, Lord, who is like unto thee, which delivereth, which delivereth the poor from him that is too strong for him? That you have an enemy, that you have a problem that goes beyond you, that's no reason to be dejected. You have a God who is greater than the enemy. You have a God who is stronger than the enemy. And because you have a father, you have a God, and you have a savior stronger than the enemy, that's why you rejoice. And then you say, all my bones shall say, Lord, who is like unto thee, which delivers the poor from him that is too strong for him. And you know, sometimes I, I told you already that when somebody hears a bad news, it's like, uh, well, what am I living for anymore? But when good news comes, and then you have joy. That joy, that happiness, that gladness revives you. 
and you begin to live again. It's like, uh, you know, when Jacob had the news. And in fact, they didn't tell him. They didn't tell him. They lied directly. Or oh, you know the story. They took Joseph. And they took the beautiful clothes that he had on. And then they sold him now to the Ishmaelites. And he just uh, killed an animal and put the clothes in the blood. And then they came back home. And uh, as they came back home, it's, uh, they then they said, Daddy, this we found. Now, you, you see what people do. They, are not, they, they don't want to take responsibility for making you sad. You make yourself sad. They tell you, you take your conclusion. And that's what they do in life. And that's what people do to you, you don't understand. They showed him the clothes. And he said, look at this. Is this your child's clothes? Yes. Well, this is what we found. Then they stopped. And then when they give you information like that, your mind now begins to work. Your mind begins to think, this is my child's clothes. This is blood. And you never think, could this be his own blood or the blood of an animal? He didn't do any test. He didn't perform any experiment. He didn't find out anything. He didn't call any of his children. And normally when people talk to you, and there's a way, you look at them, and you look at the way they say it, and you look at their posture, and you look at their, you look at their comportment, everything. And you can tell, you don't even have to be a psychologist. And then you could have called Robin. Robin, please come. And then make Ruben happy. Make Ruben just relax. And then begin to tell Ruben, you know, it, this is the way it works. You see, when you give, it shall be given unto you. And begin to give Ruben some ideas and some information that he didn't have before. And Ruben would have thought, ah, I'm privileged in the family. Now, Ruben, this clothes you brought back. Can you tell me, you just told me, you just said, this is clothes. Can you tell me the conclusion? And then you look straight in Ruben's eyes. And you can tell, if he's going to deceive you, first of all, he'll drop his head. Then he will think of what he wants to say, that you will not be able to puncture. If somebody wants to tell a lie, he doesn't want you to puncture it. Therefore, he will think. But if that is the truth, you are not going to think. And therefore, Jacob could have just be at ease and find out. But you know, when people tell us things, immediately you jump to conclusion and you make yourself sad. And Jacob said, no doubt, no doubt at all. An evil beast has killed my son. I will die with him. Made himself sad. Because he didn't find out, you know, sadness, grief, takes away our mental faculty. Takes away our thought. And we're not able to think through, is this real? Is this the right thing? Or are these people just deceiving me? But eventually they went to Egypt. And when they got to Egypt, they discovered that Joseph was there. And this Joseph was a man right there now, distributing the food and selling the food. And it's next to Pharaoh. And then they came back. When they came back, they told their father. And they said, Joseph, your son is still alive. Again, it came as a shock to him. Look at Genesis chapter 45. Genesis 45, reading from verse 26. Genesis 45, verse and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is a God over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph's heart fainted, for he believed them not. When you believed the first lie, when the truth eventually comes, because this truth contradicts the lie, and you thought the lie was the absolute truth. The truth that comes later, you can't believe anymore. How are we going to help you? You have believed the lie, you are depressed. You accept that lie as 100% true. Now eventually God wants to help you. And he now brings the truth to you. And you say, the truth contradicts what I believe. I'm believing a lie. I accept. I believe that Joseph is dead. And you are now telling me that Joseph is alive. I will not believe that. You will not believe what will help you and make you come alive. You see, that's what grief, sorrow, sadness, that's what it does to us. And, and they told him all the words of Joseph. 
which he had said unto them. And when he saw, ah, you need to see something now. You know, he got into his depression and dejection by seeing that cloak that he did in blood. Now he saw, when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, his spirit, the spirit of Joseph, their father, revived. The spirit revived. You know, the healing starts from the inside. The strength comes from the inside. His spirit, the inner man, revived. And because his inner man revived, he said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Do you understand that sentence there? I will see him. Before I die, I will see him before I die. The understanding is this. He knew he wasn't going to die until he saw Joseph. Now Joseph is alive. You know, you can beat death at a distance. And you can say, please hold on. I'm not ready to die now. I, I, let me explain to you. If you look at the survey of nursing mothers, look at this woman. Normally she is, uh, you know, sickly, always down. Today it's, you know, my back. Tomorrow is my joint. But she's not got any child yet. And she's very, very weak, almost anemic, not having enough blood. And then eventually something happens that she becomes pregnant. And then she delivers the baby. For the first six months, this woman will not be sick. Find out. Nursing mothers, they don't generally fall sick. They wake up in the night. What they cannot do ordinarily, what they will not be subjected to ordinarily, that even nobody will expect them to take all that trouble, wake up in the night, nurse a baby, and sleep again, and do this and that. For the first six months that that nursing mother is nursing that baby, she decides she is not going to be sick. And she's strong. Why? Joy. Because she's so happy now to have a child. And then, even though she didn't sleep well enough at night, and somebody comes in the morning, 7 o'clock knocking the door, she wakes up and opens the door. Pray, did you hear? I have a child. See now, what are you going to take? And then he goes to prepare breakfast. He does. This woman that was sickly before, and that, you know, she was a dejected woman, a discouraged woman, a sick woman. But now, because of the joy of having a child, then she becomes very well and very healthy. And then he keeps that health because of the joy. It's only when the child begins to go to school. And a child begins to disrespect the mother and disobey the mother and the joy evaporates then she resumes a normal career of sickness <laughs> now the woman can be sick again can be dejected again why it's the sorrow because when she was happy with the child no sickness that's what i'm telling you joy brings health you will be healthy and the devil will not cheat you anymore in Jesus' name. We're going to point number two. The spiritual peel in joy. The spiritual peel in joy. Proverbs chapter 17. In Proverbs chapter 17, reading from verse 22. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. A merry heart, a happy heart, a joyful heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. A broken spirit dries the bones, but a merry heart is like a pill, it's like medicine. And then because of that joy, you're able to maintain your real happiness. That's why the Lord told us in Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6, reading from verse 25, Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Take no thought for your life. What you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. 
Is not the life more than the meat and the body more than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto a stature? Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the, of the field, how they sow, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. There, wherefore, if God so close the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more close you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? The Lord is us. Worry and anxiety will tear down your system, will break down your constitution. But if you are not worried, at all, think about it. Does your worry solve the problem? No. Does your worry give you a solution? No. If, any, if anything at all, worry and anxiety, they have a way of blocking our mind, of, not, of making us fussy in our thinking, of making us confused, muddled up in our thinking. When you are worried and anxious, you will not see the right way to take. Let's say you are going on a journey and your, your mind is occupied with worry and anxiety. And then you have heard a lot of stories about the road, about this and about that. Even the alternatives that you ought to take, you will not be able to think through and think fresh and think clear on those alternatives because you are so worried and anxious. But if you relax and know that God is with you and that the God of wisdom will give you the wisdom to solve all the problems you have, and even this persecution in which we have this passage, this persecution is nothing. That God must have an end, a goal, a purpose for allowing this. And I want to see the good in this thing that is coming to my life rather than getting all tied up, all bound, and all worried, all anxious. A new day will be done in for you. Amen. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30. A sound heart is a life of the flesh. You see that? It's talking of the heart. And then it's talking of the flesh. A sound heart is the life of the flesh. Oh, there's a way you can take that physically. Because you understand, if your heart stop, I mean the real heart, not taking it as a center of life, not taking it as a spiritual and the spirit as a soul, but your real heart. If that heart stops uh, in its normal operation of pumping blood and receiving and pumping and then distributing your body, if that heart stops doing that, then your flesh is gone. Your body is gone. You are dead. A sound heart, a good heart, a healthy heart is the is this life of the flesh. But now beyond that, your own mind, your own heart, your own soul, your own spirit, make it sound. Keep it sound. Do not allow any information into that heart that is going to honestly disturb you. Of course, you cannot avoid hearing something negative. What I'm saying is this. Let's say you are sick. I know you are not sick. You will not be sick. But let's say somebody is sick. And because he's sick, he's very, very weak. He has lost appetite. And he knows that the process of getting sick, what contributed to this is that many, many people said a lot of things to him. That when he collected all the pieces of information together, it actually broke him down. How does that person come back to life, come back to strength, come back to vitality? Remember, these were the things like arrows that were thrown at him that brought him down. If he continues having those same arrows thrown at him, will he get up? Give yourself a break. Give yourself a vacation. What I mean is this. Vacation from this period, I will not hear this kind of thing. And somebody comes and he says, hey, 
You remember what I told you two weeks ago? I have more information about that depressing news. Ah, I'm on vacation now. I can't hear that now. The one I had two weeks ago, I'm almost dying. I'm on vacation. Go your way. And then another person came and he said, Huh, are you still alive? The information you had has not killed you. I have more information for you. Ah, I'm on vacation. Until your heart becomes strong. Until your heart will regain a strength. You don't hear any of those things deliberately. And then after your heart is strong, and then your strong heart has given you a healthy body. Now, any information that comes, you have the shield of faith. The shield of faith, beyond all, above all, taking the shield of faith, whereby we shall be able to quench all the furry darts of the wicked. Protect yourself. Protect yourself. Bad information, bad news, depressing news that will weaken your heart and make your heart sick. And after your heart is sick, will make your body sick. Be on vacation. Then when you are strong and you know that the shield of faith is now there, you can handle any matter. Come back to Proverbs chapter 14 verse 13. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy is the rottenness of the bulls. Envy is the rottenness of the bulls. You know, if you are envious of people, you kill yourself. If you are jealous of people, you destroy yourself. Because you become worried, why is it they have it and I don't have it? Why are they happy and I'm not happy? And why are they making it and I'm not making it? If you are envious like that, you are destroying yourself. Just let it go. Just let it go. And say, he has his life to live. I have my life to live. What he has, he needs. What I need, the Lord has given me. I don't need what he has because I'm not doing what he's doing. And since I'm not doing what he's doing, I don't need to be jealous of him. Look up here. I am not a farmer. Then I see a farmer. He has cutlass. I'm not jealous of him. I don't want that cutlass. I don't need it. And then he has this mechanical uh, machine, bulldozer. It goes boom, boom, boom. Everything is clean. I'm not jealous of him. I don't need it. That's not my work. I'm not a farmer. And you find somebody who might be a medical doctor. Now because he's a medical doctor, he has this, he has this. And then when he's talking, let's say when he's preaching, for example, if he's also a preacher, he uses the terminology, this, that terminology. I'm not jealous of him. I'm not a doctor. I have my own work. He has his own work. What he needs, God has given him. What I need, God has given me. And therefore, although he has what I don't have, but I don't need what he has because I don't use, I don't do his work. I have what I need. And therefore, I'm not jealous of him. Have that attitude in your life that envy is the rottenness of the bulls. Don't be envious at anybody. Somebody is doing something great. Praise the Lord. That's his calling. I have my own calling. And the Lord has given me the talent and the gift appropriate for my calling. Full stop. And that gives you joy and your joy will never end. Then we're told in Proverbs chapter 15 verse 13. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 13. A merry heart make us a cheerful countenance. A merry heart. A happy heart. It's on the inside. A happy, merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. But by sorrow of heart, the spirit is broken. And when you are weakened on the inside, when you are broken on the inside, you are gone. Keep a happy countenance, happy thoughts, joyful life. Verse 30, the light of their eyes rejoices the heart. The light of the eyes rejoices the heart. And a good report maketh the bulls fat. A good report maketh the bulls fat. You know, there are people that um, almost destroys their own, their own wives or their own husbands. Now, you, you need to understand the composition or the constitution of the woman is very, very different from that of the man. 
And you know, sometimes women, uh, if you are the normal man, the average man, there are some men that are like women. But if you are the average man, you hear something now. And when you hear it, you know, it boils and starts up in your heart. And then because women involved with some of these activities, and no matter when you are active, you are doing this and doing this and doing this, the concentration that you have on that thing that you are doing will just make you to forget the other thing. It, you, what it means is this, for example, you have water in the bucket. And the water you have in the bucket, if you try to empty it directly, you don't have the strength to empty it. It will take a long time. You are taking a cup out, a cup out, and then it takes you a long time. Don't do that. Just leave the water in the bucket and then pour sand inside, pour sand inside. All the water will vanish away. Am I right? So when you have thoughts that depress you and thoughts that make you just feel to collapse, the thing is not true. You know, sit down and be thinking about it. Meditate. You make yourself more sad. And you make yourself more sick. Get active. Get involved. And do this and do this and do this. While you are involved in those activities, all the thoughts you had before, everything will just get away from you. We may, because we're active like that, if we, we hear any bad news, if we're any bad thing, we generally will get active and do whatever we're doing, and then we get over it. If you tell your wife, especially if it is something that belittles your wife, somebody said, if it is something that destroys the self-esteem and the image of your wife, because she needs to have self-esteem, and she needs to, you know, accept herself self-acceptation self-acceptance if you tell your wife my wife this is not coming from me you understand i love you i don't have any problem with you but you know i was surprised that a person i called my best friend or i told him to his face that i didn't like what he said but this is what he said about you eh? What has he been saying? Well, since, you know, the Bible says we should tell the truth. With all her, every I know inside me. She said, how did I marry you? That you of all people, that don't you have eyes to see? And this is what he told me. Of. <laughs> that you're ugly. You don't know how to dress. In fact, I told him, shut up. He didn't shut up. He told me, days day, after he told me, I just felt I should be faithful as a husband. And tell you, I don't believe it, all, but this is what he said. <laughs> after you have got over it and then you reconcile with your friend, that woman, every time he, she sees that man, that thing will come back again. This man said, I am ugly. And then she goes back to look at the mirror. This, this. Every morning she will remember and it will spoil her day. You kill your wife yourself. Have information management. And know when you hear things about your husband, what to tell him. When you hear things about your wife, what to tell her. Because you see, all those things that you tell one another may destroy your wife, may destroy your husband. Deal with it and let it go and be a happy family. And God is going to lift you up. You will never come down again in Jesus' name. Amen. Tell her good, good things. Do good. Make a commitment. You are going to tell your wife good things. A good report maketh the bones fat. And then we're looking at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 66. In Isaiah chapter 66, we're reading verse 14. Isaiah 66, verse 14. And when you shall see this, your heart shall rejoice. And your bones shall flourish like an herb. And you see the connection there. Once your heart is rejoicing, your heart shall rejoice. And then your bones shall flourish like an herb. The hand of the Lord shall be known toward his servants. 
and his his indignation towards enemies. God will defeat all those enemies for you. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. Proverbs 13, verse 12. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. You are expecting something. You are concentrating too much on it. You are meditating too much on it. And the thing is not coming at the time you want it to come. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. And if your heart is sick, it doesn't help matters. Therefore, make yourself happy. God has a reason. And those people that were delayed in the Bible, the he who laughs last, laughs best. And you remember Anna. It was like we say late before having child, but think about the kind of child. Samuel, not ordinary child. Sarah, it was about late, hope deferred. Because they are saved. Almost late, and yet a special child, Isaac. Elizabeth and Zechariah, it's like it was too late. And yet, they had John the Baptist. Comfort yourself that even though it appears late and the hope is being deferred, I'm not going to allow that to make my heart say, I am still going to be joyful in the Lord. But when the desire comes, he it is a tree of life. You will live. We come to point number three, the steady progress of the joyful. The steady progress of the joyful. In your personal life, you will progress. In your ministerial life, you will progress. But always, you know, just, just carry the joy of the Lord along with you. And that joy of the Lord will help you to make that steady progress in Acts of the Apostles chapter 5, verse 14. And to him they, ag they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing. They beat them. Now, you, you need to understand, if you beat a small child, that he is a child of maybe 8 or 10 or 12. You know, the child doesn't count that as anything special. That's how they beat a little children to correct them, you spank them, and no big deal. But when the child is becoming 18, 19, 20, and then you still want to beat, one day the child will say, Daddy, with all respect, you know who I am, you know how old I am now, 18. Are you still going to be beating me like you did when I was only eight? And when the child becomes 21, 22, come on here. And then stretch out your hand. Daddy, you don't mean that. <laughs> you see, you know, I'm a man now at 21. Am I a boy now? I'm no more a teenager. Teen, teen, 14, 15, 16, 19, 21. Are you still going to be beating me like you did when I was a teenager? You know, when people get older, it's very insulting to beat them. And these are apostles, and they beat them like teenagers. But don't allow what they do to get you down. Nobody can take your joy or your health from you by what they do. It's what you do to yourself. It's what you think about it. That's what takes the joy away from you. They beat them. They belittled them. And then it says, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing. It's your interpretation. Interpret everything that comes to you with an attitude that maintains your joy. Rejoicing that they counted, they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. That is, they kept on making progress. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13. Acts, chapter 13, verse 50. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women, and the chief men of the city, and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them out of their coast. But they shook off the dust of 
their feet against them and came unto Iconium. Before I read verse 52, uh, what's your interpretation? The Jews stood up, devout, honorable women, and the chief men of the city. They raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and they expelled them. Expelled them. You know, the, the interpretation matters a lot. Barnabas. The Lord called us and sent us out. And these people expelled us. Well, that means we didn't pray enough. You go on a guilt trip. You begin to make yourself guilty unnecessarily. They expelled us. We didn't pray enough. They expelled us. Where is our faith? They expelled us. Are we still servants of God? They expelled us. We have failed. We have failed. Barnabas, we are failures. When you think like that, you'll not be happy. They expelled us. They expelled us. It's their responsibility. That's up to them. They rejected Jesus, rejected us. No big deal. It's not my fault. I remain faithful. I remain firm. I did what the Lord has called me to do. They misunderstood. They didn't accept. They expelled us. Put the blame back on them. Put the responsibility back on them. Don't feel guilty for what other people do. Even if it affects you, don't take the blame. It's their responsibility. They're acting like that because that's who they are. And that keeps you happy and joyful. Verse 52. And the disciples were filled with what? Joy. They expelled them, but they didn't take the blame or the guilt or the condemnation, and they were still filled with joy. Look at the next chapter, verse 1, 14, verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and of also of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Let's stop there for a moment. You know, uh, please look up here, brothers and sisters. A leader should have a goal. A leader should have a vision. A leader should have a project. This is what I'm going to achieve. Don't submit the document of your plan. Don't submit the document of your vision. Don't submit the document of your dream to the hands of the enemy. You see, there are people, they allow the reactions of people to control them. And they allow the persecution to beat them back. And they allow the reactions of the people to cancel the vision. And to wipe away the dream. Now you see in this chapter 14, in verse 2, the unbelieving Jews start up, the Gentiles, and make their minds evil affected against the brethren. Look at verse 3. Long time therefore. Long time therefore. You know what Paul the Apostle said? Uh, Paul said, I even wanted to stay here for a short time before. Now because of your resistance and because of your unbelief and because of trying to instigate the people to run us out of town, because of that, therefore, long time abode they. That's how to carry on your vision. When you know that this is where you go, and this is what you do. And you are joyful. And you are happy. And a joyful man, you will not forget yourself. And you know that this is where I'm going. Even in the midst of that persecution. Even in the midst of that resistance. Say, okay, I even want to try to do a moderate work before. I wanted to just go this far and stop. Now because of the stirring up of that persecution long time, therefore abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. You will succeed. Because you see, when you hear this, if you hear this over and over, it will change your mental concept. 
and it will change your attitude to the situations that happen in life and then the joy of the lord will be your strength psalm 32 verse 11 psalm 32 i'm reading from verse 11 be glad in the lord and rejoice ye righteous are you righteous by the grace of god be glad in the lord and rejoice ye righteous and shout for joy all ye that are upright in heart and so the lord is saying from now on you will rejoice 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 all the time rejoice all the time now pay attention let's say you those who are looking down look out <laughs> praise the lord let's say for example when you are very young now please don't misunderstand there are people that write on the left hand and i've seen their writing some of them their writings are more beautiful than those of us write with the right hand so don't don't misunderstand my illustration let's say you have been writing with the left hand left hand all the time and now you are about 30 years of age and then somebody tells you and convinces you writing with the right hand is a great experience then you say, okay, you're not going to write with the right hand. When you start writing with the right hand, it will look clumsy. It will look unnatural. It will look as if, what is this kind of thing? If you're not careful, you go back to your left hand, writing. But if you say, they told me, writing with the left, right hand is a joyful experience. It's a wonderful experience. Now the first day, as you try, you look slow. It will look sluggish. It will look clumsy. It will look inconvenient. And your mind will be telling you, change. Go back to your normal left hand. But don't change. The second day, pick up your pen again and write with the right hand. It's still, it's still clumsy. It's still like, who am I? What am I trying to do? And then you continue, you continue, you continue like that. And any time, naturally, the natural thing, you want to pick up a pen, you pick up with your left hand. Then you catch yourself. Say, no, stop always catch yourself be your own policeman and say no stop and then go back to the right hand by the time you do that continuously one month two months three months you're writing fine with your right hand what i'm telling you is this normally when something happens you feel dejected you, you build up a habit of being dejected be your own policeman when you hear something and when you see something and it brings dejection hey stop i'm your policeman i catch you don't do that then you switch on to your right hand i am happy in the lord i am joyful in the lord i am boisterous i'm walking on the waters of life nothing will bring me down it will seem close clumsy you are deceiving yourself you are sad and you are saying you are happy don't mind what that inner voice is saying another thing happens again and then you are likely to go back to your left hand say no i'm your policeman i catch you switch on the right hand and then it will look clumsy at the beginning by the time you practice that and you do that for about uh, three months even if it takes one year that's okay because now all this left hand all the negative thinking has been for 30 40 years spending one year and wiping the plate clean and switching onto the right and becoming joyful in the lord and then what a wonderful thing to spend just one year to switch over onto joy and then the rest of your life 20 30 40 years extra is going to be a life of joy yeah. and a life of fulfillment yeah. and nothing will bring you down anymore in jesus name yeah. that's why it says in philippians chapter 4 verse 4 rejoice in the lord always again i say rejoice in first thessalonians chapter 5 First Thessalonians chapter 5, I'm reading to you there from verse 16. First Thessalonians 5, verse 16. Rejoice evermore. Rejoice evermore. I said rejoice evermore. Whatever you are going through in life, begin the practice today. The Lord Jesus said, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Rise up, let's rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. Don't let them bring you down again. Rejoice. Don't let sorrow fill your heart anymore. Rejoice. Don't let the negative thinking bring you down anymore. Rejoice. That joy will be the strength of your life. 
that joy will strengthen your bone. That joy will make you to flourish. Rejoice. You'll be healthy. You'll be sound. Don't allow negative thoughts in your mind. Don't spread bad news. You are destroying the people. You are telling bad news. Rejoice. Joyful heart. Happy mind. Your emotional diet. The joy of the Lord. That will be your strength. 